Roger. Thank you, sir. Hello, everyone. This little box that I'm holding, this little mysterious box, represents a huge part of my childhood and an exciting part. I used to get a lot of mail order magic. So I get these little boxes in the mail, and I would open them up, and I knew that once I discovered the secret inside, that I would have all the power, the force, the women, and all, <laughs> all of these things that a young man desires and needs uh, to survive. But we'll get back to the box uh, in just a moment. It all started off, for me, uh, right here. Soak that in a little bit. That's uh, my parents playing naked volleyball with their friends. <clears throat> so I grew up in a, in a back-to-the-land community, kind of uh, 1970s, and uh, beyond this uh, naked volleyball, which was equal parts astonishing as it was terrifying, um, I lived in a really colorful place. My dad was a, a musician. He played in the bluegrass band. Uh, there was the Barnes Creek Country Fair, which was frequented by equal parts hippies and bikers. And uh, we had all these crazy people dropping by our house. There was Uncle Tio and this guy named Jake, who I have no idea who he was, but he, every time he came, he would talk about this book that he was writing that was going to change the world. And I believed it all, and I lapped it up, and I loved it all, and, and um, it was a really cool time to live, and I think that's what initially got me excited about uh, magic and becoming a magician and learning more about astonishment. So just to clear the air, calling yourself a magician is one of the strangest things you can ever do. <laughs> when I say I'm a magician, people usually have a, a mixed reactions. They say, oh, a magician, like, uh, yeah, I had an uncle. He drank a lot, but he knew all those card tricks and stuff. He was pretty... <laughs> That's well, pretty good. Or I get, oh, you're a magician, so you do the, the balloon animals and the face painting. and You know what? That's wacky, and that's fun. It's good for you. <laughs> and sometimes when I'm lucky and I talk about magic, somebody says, oh, my gosh, I saw a magician, and they did this thing, and it was so incredible, and my mind was blown, and I have no idea, and it was such a cool moment. And that's like music to my ears because I know that that person has seen the higher side, the brightest side of our art, and they've actually seen a moment of astonishment. So let's talk about that. And this is a topic of my speech, astonishment. Now for some of you, uh, if you haven't had you know, a, a magician do something for you and experienced it up close, astonishment might mean something like you, know, you lost something and then it's gone, it's out of your mind, and two years later, you're digging around in your car, and you find something in the car seat, and there's that ring again. You go, whoa, there it is. You're astonished for a moment. From a magician's perspective, it's when you perform a magic trick, you put a coin in someone's hand, and they open it, and it's gone. And it's, this is the feeling, and the reason I got into magic, you have this, it's like the air gets sucked out of the room, and you have this white light, beautiful, crystal clear moment of astonishment, really a childlike state of wonder. In this little moment, in this little pocket, you're not worried about whether or not you plug the parking meter. You're not worried about if your relationship is working out. You're not worried about uh, all of life's stresses. They melt away. So this is a powerful moment. It's something that I think can be used in a different way and should be looked at. And my mentor, uh, Paul Harris, and my business partner, likens this moment to an instant meditation, which is a really cool way to look at it. So magic is essentially delivering you an instant meditation. And it's a very, very special moment. Um, so I'm going to show you a clip right now uh, from a DVD series <laughs> called, called True Astonishments. Have a look. Holy <laughs> Turn it over and read what it says. One, two, three. Look. You guys see that? My mind is blown. 
Cool, right? Very cool. I mean, who, who doesn't want to feel like that and more often, right? So there's something really cool in this, and it's important for me to let people know that magic doesn't just happen. There's not just some grab bag of tricks floating out there in the, you know, in the, the ethers that magicians can pull from. Somebody, to get those screaming reactions and that kind of emotion, somebody actually had to sit down in a room and they had to invent something. They had to invent a magic trick, beat by beat, blow by blow, just like any artist would, any musician, any painter, an architect. So this is actually a carefully crafted human experience. And I think it's in that crafting that there's something greater uh, in magic. So why does magic work? A lot of people ask that question. Magic can work for us <clears throat> because as human beings, we assume a million things every day. Not, I mean, just tons of things. You would have to you know, assume that this floor was made out of carpet or that this jacket was actually made out of a nice felt blend instead of sea kelp or something like that. But without coming up here and actually physically touching this and, and touching the plants, and we, we're lost. There's a, a spot where we're totally not sure what's going on. And this not being sure is a really cool place. These blind spots are actually a magician's playground. That's cool, right? So <laughs> it's my hope that more and more people start playing in this playground that magicians play in as well. And um, just for fun, just to illustrate something interesting for the audience, let me do something. Um, I'm gonna do something with these kings, and this is where the cameras can check that out. Look at that. Can you guys see from the back? We've got four kings, the clubs, hearts, spades, diamonds. Watch very carefully, like really, really close. You guys good over there? Watch. I'm gonna take the kings, put them in my pocket, very slowly. I'm gonna bring my hand out, it's empty. <laughs> this is pretty I'm going to show everyone all the rest of the cards, all the rest of the cards. Can you guys see? Watch. Now, at this point, everyone in the audience, if you're normal, we have to assume a couple of things. That I have a deck of cards between my hands, yes, and the four kings are in my pocket. But because this is a carefully crafted human experience invented by my magician friend Aaron Fisher, look at this. If I do this, I can make you believe that somehow the deck is slowly melting away one card at a time until there's only four cards. And if those four cards happen to be the kings that I just put in my pocket, <laughs> then the kings have to be where? Or the deck has to be where? In my pocket, right? Does that hold your applause? That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> and um, thank you. <laughs> but likewise, these glasses that I'm wearing right now are ridiculous. I don't even need glasses, actually, and I don't have lenses in them. <laughs> But your brains fill that in, and these are the blind spots that we get to play in. So it's, it's fun, and it's important work. So stay with me. <laughs> stay with me. Um, so I started looking at that, and did anybody notice what I did in that moment when the, the deck kind of like started going away, and people clapped, and I got excited? I did what 95% of all magicians in the world would do at that moment. I started getting a little bit confident, and uh, I started you know, bathing in my own light of mystery. And uh, the ego started to show through. I almost gestured like this, as if to make you believe <laughs> that, you know, I was born on top of a pyramid and my mother was an owl or something like that. <laughs> and I, I think this is where magic, kind of people stop taking it seriously because it's always attached to kind of an ego of a performer. And so I look at this as, wow, this astonishment could be a cool tool. And I think others look at it as, well, yeah, you're a magician, you do this thing and that's what it is. So knowing this and being aware of this, I started seeking out other creative artists um, around that were doing astonishing things, um, but doing so without taking credit for it. So this was my kind of goal. How do we spread astonishment without me being the guy to you know, suck it all up? And this, this kind of exploration led me to the Bay Area, San Francisco, where I met this phenomenal group of people, and I ended up joining a secret society. You heard me right. I can't talk about it much today because it is a secret society. Um, but these guys were doing remarkable things. And I'm about to show you a film clip, not yet, uh, but I'm about to show you a clip of a film called The Institute, directed by my friend Spencer McCall. And it's playing around in the circuit and the festivals right now. But he kind of got inside of the secret society and he was able to film a little bit of what was happening. 
So this, this group I joined, just to sum it up, artist Jeff Hall out of the Oakland area and a creative group of people started this live, immersive, interactive game in San Francisco, Oakland area. And you might get involved in this game by, uh, you know, there would be a flyer on the wall, so you go and, and you know, the flyer would be advertising something ridiculous like self-help guru in town for one week only, um, call now or something, and you would take the number and you would call that number and you would get a, a message that would say, meet at this location. So you would go to this location and it might be an empty warehouse and somebody would be standing there and they would hand you a key and that would be the next clue and that would go to the next clue and to the next clue. This game that they did lasted over three years. Had hundreds of people playing it all over the city and it was an amazing, amazing event. So this clip I'm about to set up, the participants were asked to go to a pay phone and I'll let the, the rest uh, explain itself. Do you see 24th Street? Yeah. Cross mission and continue down 24th. I will be making contact at that location in five minutes time. When I say ornithopter, you say jumpsuit. Ornithopter. Jumpsuit. Ornithopter. Jumpsuit. Okay, now go, hurry. Ornithopter. Jumpsuit. Ornithopter. Jumpsuit. Now we can get this transaction rolling. The time is nigh. Now, listen quickly. Dance. You heard me. Dance. I say dance. Dance. Okay. It is imperative that you now dance. I hope you dance. This interaction cannot happen without rigorous physical jamming. Now get off this phone and dance, motherfucker! Uh, we needed to stop the energy attack by rigorous physical jamming, which is what we did. So I started dancing and then I started hearing music and this guy showed up with a boombox and he started dancing with me. And then a Sasquatch showed up and he started dancing with us. And uh, there was then there was a moment on that uh, the song ended and we heard what sounded like angels singing and the Sasquatch gave me the transcript. Which that's a very weird thing to say, but that happened. <laughs> Amazing, right? Astonishing. So uh, what I glean from this is that both this immersive game and the art of magic uh, both have the same end in mind, the same intention, and that's to pop people out of their worlds, to pop paradigms, to take people down the rabbit hole, and to astonish. So science tells us that novelty and new things uh, help our brains release a higher level of dopamine, which is the happy chemical. And if you go to a marriage counselor or if you go to a, a psychologist, they say, go on a vacation or, um, you know, go eat at a new restaurant. And I think that's good advice. But I also think that everyone in the room has the power within them to participate, not only in delivering astonishment to people, but to also receiving it. And I think that that is a choice that we can make every day, wherever you work, how ri however rich or poor you are. And I think we can borrow from magicians and we can borrow from creative artists, but everyone in the room, I think, has a grab bag of their own things that we can go from. So astonishment can be used as a tool. Imagine you're a teacher and you've got a bunch of lethargic ninth graders texting and falling asleep in the back of the class, and you're over here, and all of a sudden, a textbook slides across and opens up by itself. How would the students react to that? When their minds are blown, I bet that lesson would sink in a little bit deeper. Likewise, you know, that same teacher could organize one of these immersive games where uh, you get the principal in on it with uh, a, an announcement and all of a sudden there's gorillas running through and you have clues and things and you have to rescue, you know, Norman Jones from the uh, high school equipment locker or something like that. These things are fun, they create leadership, they create self-worth, exercise and interaction. 
And if you're out here right now and, and you run a company and your employees are there nine to five working their butts off, why not have 20 ninjas infiltrate and deliver hot pizza one day? I mean, what kind of buzz would that create, right? What kind of buzz and camaraderie and stuff is good? And this can be simple too, you guys. It could be as simple as a cocktail napkin rose that you make someone and teach them how to make so they can give it to their loved one. You know, we talked about assumptions. You know, maybe you're having a dinner party and people assume that you're gonna make the chicken again, but you kick the door open with that three foot tall mashed potato volcano. <laughs> this is powerful work. Um, but really, uh, just, to, just to wrap this up, we don't need to wait for magicians or for a vacation to do this stuff. I mean, it's a tough world out there. I think commit yourself today to doing something astonishing for somebody around you. And I really believe that the more we put out there as far as creating extraordinary experiences for people, the more that we're gonna start seeing the extraordinary in our own lives. And uh, this box right here, we'll get back to this little box. If this represents me as a nerdy high school kid hoarding all of the magic secrets, all of the power, and the uh, inside this box, this little white box represents maybe the higher level of magic, the idea of astonishment. I think we need to expand on that idea and lead with the intention of astonishment because with deviation comes wonder and joy, mystery, and sometimes even a little bit of happiness. Thank you guys so much. Good night. <laughs>